years ago, New York authorized a multi-billion dollar subsidy program, which, in addition to billions of federal dollars, helped lure Micron Technology to commit to building a $100 billion chip-making factory complex in central New York. In the wake of the project falling behind schedule, as well as changes in the power structure in Washington, D.C., we wanted to examine where this project stands and what its future looks like. To do that, we're joined in the Capitol Press Room by Glenn Coyne, a reporter with Syracuse Post Standard and Syracuse.com, who earlier this year I got to see get recognized as Journalist of the Year by the Syracuse Press Club. Welcome to the show, Glenn, and congrats on the recognition. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Good to be here. So for starters, what has Micron committed to build in the Syracuse suburbs? And can you give us a, a, a brief outline of some of the government subsidies they're going to tap into? A committed might be the wrong word. Um, okay. There's no formal contract. But what they've said they're going to do, what they plan to do and are moving toward doing, is building uh, four massive uh, fabrication plants, or fabs they call them, uh, over, the, over the next 20 years. And each one of those fabs is uh, 28 acres, just the fab itself, let alone all the ancillary buildings, the parking garages, et cetera. So this is, they've got 1,400 acres of land, and they're going to use a good chunk of that to build this project over the next 20 years. They plan to employ up to 9,000 people at the end of that, and that could create, according to the state, uh, another 40,000 jobs in the region. And what type of government subsidies are they planning to tap into? And do you have a sense of what they might all be worth when added up? For the first phase of this, which is the first two fabs, which Micron says will cost them about $48 billion, with a B, dollars, they are set to get somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 billion of that uh, from various government agencies. The biggest chunk of it comes from the federal government in terms of a a grant under the Chips and Science Act of somewhere around 4.6 billion and a tax credit for the buildings and the machinery uh, of somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 11.3 billion is what Micron has estimated. Uh, In addition, if they build the whole thing, all four, they get up to 5.5 billion, I believe from the state. And there's also some local sweeteners, a big property tax break yet to be determined and probably a billion or more in sales tax breaks. So all that adds up to somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 billion out of the $48 billion, or about 40% of that. None of these are actually handed out. The, the, these are all tied to them actually building and hiring, hitting certain yet-to-be-determined milestones. Well, in late October, you wrote about the delays with Micron's construction, which was supposed to start in June of 2024 and was pushed back to early next year. And your reporting is now that it's not anticipated to begin until uh, possibly November of 2025. Do you have a sense of the reason for the project falling a year and a half behind schedule? And is that a meaningful delay in the time frame for this massive of an undertaking? What we've been told um, is that the, the, the main reason that it's taking so long is the uh, environmental impact statement they had to prepare for both federal and state government. These things can be thousands and thousands of pages long, and they look at everything from job creation to housing to air quality, et cetera. That is taking much longer than anyone anticipated. That is supposed to come out now, at least the draft, in December. So next month, we should get a look at that. The other reason is that Micron confirmed the the presence and breeding of a couple of endangered species of bats. And so that means under state and federal law, they can't be cutting trees down during the time the bats might be there. So Micron can't cut trees from, I think it's April 1st to October 31st. So theoretically, they could wrap up all the approvals by next summer, but still have to wait until November before they can start clearing. It's been delayed now a year and a half from the original. One Micron executive told me after the first delay that the initial timeline was aggressive, and this one is more realistic. This is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of a 20-year project, and a lot of people I talk to say this is not unusual for a project of this size with this many moving parts to be delayed by a year or a year and a half, and out of 20 years, they're not all that worried about it. Well, this isn't the only chip-making complex underdeveloped in America right now. So are 
efforts to build other facilities being stymied by similar problems, or is this experience in New York unique? It's unique in in the the specific the specifics. Excuse me. They've got a lot of wetlands. They have to get approval to fill in by the Army Corps and the BATS, in addition to some other things. The other projects are going up. Several in Arizona, Texas. These are the big ones, and uh, one in Ohio. And so those are all farther along than this project, in part because they were announced earlier, in part because they have fewer restrictions on them. They also, everybody but Micron and Clay got an exemption from the more rigorous environmental reviews last month, two months ago. Micron is building a fab in Boise, where it, Ohio, Idaho, where its headquarters are. That one was always kind of projected to go first anyway, because it's going to prototype the chips they're going to build here in Clay. But that one's moving along, and again, that one does not have the environmental restrictions that this one has, nor does Idaho or those other states have the same level of state review that we have here. Well, I want to get to the impact of the elections on the future of this project, but first, I'm curious if you're hearing anything about market forces that could be impacting Micron's commitment to this endeavor, because like you said, there is no, say, written contract to do this work. So is there any sense that they're wavering uh, about the long-term benefits of this uh, investment that could be slowing their timeline for breaking ground? That's certainly possible. Uh, one analyst I talked to thought that that could be a, the case, that the AI boom that uh, Micron is counting on, that Micron will be a big player in with their chips, is not taking off as fast as everyone expected. There could be a lot of reasons. Uh, Micron is a publicly traded company, doesn't say a whole lot about its reasons for doing things. So we don't have a ton of insight into that. But it could be that there are other factors at work that we're not aware of. And the other chip makers uh, are subject to that too. Intel is building in Ohio and Intel is having a, a number of difficult issues uh, financially, it's gonna be laying some people off. So there are market forces going on with all of these chip projects. And it's hard to know exactly which factors are at work here at in Clay, New York, or at the other places, and the other companies. Well, turning to politics, uh, in the immediate run-up to Election Day, we had House Speaker Mike Johnson in the area make some comments about the future of the federal subsidy that Micron uh, could be receiving that uh, spooked central New York, comments that he subsequently uh, downplayed. But President-elect uh, Donald Trump has been more resolute in his criticisms. So I'm curious how you think politicians in Washington, D.C., specifically maybe Republican majorities in the U.S. Senate, Republican control of the White House, could impact the future of this project? It's, it's unclear exactly what the Republicans will do. Uh, it looks like they're going to sweep presidency and both houses. So they will be able to, to affect this bill to kind of go back. The this general sense is that, and, and, and Mike Johnson, the House Speaker, uh, said this last week, that the real concern is not with the CHIPS Act and, and the fact that we're trying to bring chip manufacturing back to the U.S. They support that. But that the CHIPS Act uh, has too many restrictions um, that Republicans don't like. Johnson mentioned specifically green energy requirements, which is part of the bill. There are requirements for project labor agreements with unions, requirements for child care. So all of those things could theoretically be altered and they actually could benefit the companies if they had to, didn't have to do certain things. But it also could be that as we um, as Democrats lose power, and particularly Chuck Schumer, who's the Senate majority leader now, who won't be likely after after January, uh, he has been a huge advocate for the CHIPS Act and for Micron in particular. And so there's some concern there that New York's, the, the project here in particular, will lose some support in Washington. Uh, what that means is, you know, anybody's guess. From Micron's perspective, is this project viable without the federal support that's been committed at this point? No. And Micron has been very clear right from the beginning that uh, it costs much more to build a chip plant in the U.S., 30 to 40 percent more than in other places. Micron's big plants are in Taiwan, Singapore, and Japan. And those are all apparently uh, much cheaper places to do business than the U.S. So Micron has been very clear from the uh, CEO on down that this project only happens with substantial tax breaks uh, and, and subsidies. 
Well, you mentioned the nuance in Speaker Johnson's criticism of the federal program. You also have noted, though, in your reporting that Donald Trump, when talking about this, has been a little more blunt, uh, speaking in an interview saying the chip deal is so bad, we put up billions of dollars for rich companies. Does mm-hmm. that seem to you like there could be a divide between the White House and Congress moving forward? Or is this one of those instances where you take Donald Trump seriously, but maybe not literally? A lot of people say that that's the way we should take Trump. Um, You know what? His comments about the CHIPS Act were critical, but kind of vague. He didn't suggest repealing it. He didn't suggest at least, you know, last couple weeks ago when he was on the Joe Rogan show. Um, He didn't say he didn't say we should repeal it. He didn't say we should cut it. He just said he didn't like it. It was bad, bad deal. Um, And as I mentioned in some of my stories, um, you know, as president, Trump had uh, really no uh, no worries about overturning things his predecessors had done, Uh, whether that was, you know, altering in some ways the Affordable Care Act to uh, pulling out of the the uh, Paris Agreement. So um, so it's very possible that that Trump and and the administration could make some changes to, say, the tax law, the tax regulations. That would affect the projects. The Congress could go in and alter, in some way, the Chips Act. That would make it better or worse for uh, for certain chip makers or all chip makers. So it really, everything's on the table. It certainly um, does raise the anxiety level here to see, uh, especially to see, you know, a, a presidential candidate who is very critical now become president, and for uh, the Senate to flip. And, and our representative no longer be the most powerful person in the Senate. Well, we've been speaking with Glenn Coyne. He's a reporter with the Syracuse Post Standard at Syracuse.com. And he was recognized as the Journalist of the Year by the Syracuse Press Club. Glenn, thank you so much again for making the time. And again, congrats on the award. Thank you, David. Good to talk with you. Capital Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.